Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is March 30th. Tonight is the Horseshead Central School District uh, budget development meeting. This is the curriculum business sort of wrap up of the development budget meeting. Ms. Dale is out of town at this point, so our vice president will be taking over the leadership roles of the Board of Education. At this time, I turn it over to Mr. Brian Lynch. Could everybody please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for coming tonight to the meeting. I am going to turn over to Dr. Douglas and Katie for the presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we come to sort of the conclusion of the development tonight's budget overview, there's a lot of important things to do, but nothing more than the next slide. So board members are tireless in their efforts, and if we could have the slide move forward real quick. This is just showing the dedication of any of our members. Building aid and uh, calculation of transportation aid. 
this was adjusted down by $250,000 in each category. One of the items we looked at as we were balancing <coughs> was that transfer to capital line. We were initially uh, anticipating to spend $1.5 million out of that line, move it to the capital fund for an annual capital project. We reduced it down to $1,250,000, uh, so that $250,000 decrease is reflected here. <coughs> So if we went with the DAGI option, the increase would be a little over 9%, the BAN option a little over 6%. As promised, I have some tax rate information for you. Um, I did get some assessment data from the county. I want to stress that it's still very preliminary. Um, there is one municipality who is working on doing a full reevaluation and working through the process they have with the state. Um, that process isn't finalized yet, so we don't know if the states can accept their new valuations or not. If not, the assessments on the form I received would change as with the equalization rate. So knowing that, very preliminary, this does give you an idea of how rates would be impacted though with, with each option of the levy. So if we use no debt service, just purely the, the levy calculation as it stands, um, the levy percentage increase for DASME would be 9.05%, the ban option would be 6.36. Based on the information that I have as of now, the uh, rate change for DASME would be 8.34% or 17, uh, $17.38. And the ban option would be a rate increase of 5.67% um, or $16.95. Same scenario down below, but if we use the same level of debt service that we've used in prior years, the $630,000, it brings that rate increase down from the DASME uh, to 6.84% to 1713, ban option 4.17% or 1671. Our full value tax rate uh, for the current year was $16.04. So you can see how that rate would, how the rate impact would be changed up from the $16.04. And we'll come back towards the end of the presentation and talk more in detail about the ban and DASME options and the direction the board would like to move forward with. <coughs> Historical information that shows the relationship of the levy, levy change to the tax rate change. Historically, the levy change, or the tax rate change, excuse me, has been less than the levy change. Uh, while the numbers aren't as, as dramatic as we saw last year, that pattern still holds true that the levy change is more than the rate. So again, this is what we've seen since the beginning of February. Um, tax items does not include, include consideration for the, the levy increase at this point, and only accounts for an increase in the pilots. Other revenue increase um, due to um, the proceeds refund that we're anticipating, and then a reimbursement. Uh, summary of budget expenditures. Again, this is what we rolled the budget over with back in February. Um, it includes um, a variety of things as, such as contractual salaries, um, all the budget considerations that we've seen today and that you'll see tonight are included in these numbers. Uh, both these increases, debt service increases, um, things that we're seeing the impacts of inflation on such as fuel and energy supplies, things of that nature, um, and the increase in our SRO contract. This is updated later in the presentation so we'll, we'll hold on this for now. Preliminary gap at the beginning of the process was uh, nine million for the Disney option, eight million for the ban option. So any questions on the prior overview before I turn it over to Tony? Okay. Uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if you or Tom can address this, but is, uh, April first is like two days away. Is there any additional state aid that we're aware of? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, as far as the state budget, there is no additional aid that is going to be impactful enough for us that will be added to the budget. If anything, what we know is they will be updating the formula with the most recent numbers again. There could be some variations in our revenue expectation from the state we've been told that's more in the positive not in the negative in other words they're, they're, they
they take numbers from last year, then they take numbers from October, they update numbers in February. They're verifying our numbers. Our numbers actually improved from the February run, so for our position, we'd see that it would still continue to improve. The interesting thing is, <clears throat> in the budget, they have about $179,000 that we have to set aside right now because they've tied it as a requirement of the budget for high impact aid for tutors. Most likely, both the House and the Senate rejected that. They want the money to go flatly to the budgets. That way, there's no strings attached so the districts can use it for the offset of any of the programs that they currently have because for years and years, they keep remembering the gap elimination adjustment that we lost over $34 million and they want the money to go back and restore as much of education as possible. So it is a good education budget at the state level, but it's not an issue in their negotiations of which I believe the budget is going to be late this year, probably up until about April 5th. So we don't see any changes that will be overly changing our numbers. But as you go through the plan, you'll see we have a plan and we're getting narrower and narrower. And we think we can get there. And just to point out for that high impact tutoring, $179,000, that has not yet been these budget numbers yet. I've been holding that back, um, waiting to see if that, that requirement's going to hold because we'll have to have expenditures with that $179,000 revenue source. So if uh, the final budget does away with that, that set aside requirement, that $179,000 will go into the budget as a, as a tool to balance. But not in here yet. If it is tied to the high, I don't know why I need this. <laughs> if it is tied to that high impact tutoring, what's the definition of high impact tutoring again? So we would have to identify students uh, grades three through eight um, that are at risk of falling below New York State standard, and we would have to provide uh, tutoring sessions, no less than twice a week, no less than thirty minutes during school, after school, um, whenever we could provide it um, to those students until we determine that they're no longer at risk of failing. There's a, um, a requirement in it that you can't plan current expenditures, so it couldn't go towards something we're already doing. It would have to be a new program and new expense. And when you say new program and new expense, would it be current employees doing work after school and getting maybe stipends, or is it new hires to meet the requirements? Both are acceptable, as far as we can tell. Until it becomes official, we wouldn't have any specific guidance from the state that gives us the ins and outs and the exacts. We would give very general parameters, as Kate has mentioned, but nothing specific. We also know that right now it's one time, and one time money is dangerous when we think about adding new positions and sustainability. Okay, thank that's you. Also, a fair chunk of change. <clears throat> um, isn't that program called Academic Services that you just described? High impact tutoring? Yes. It, it, it could change. Um, the, the students being identified would be those similar to what we see in our RTI and AI services. Um, it could expand beyond the academics. We don't know the final definition of a particular grant or the set aside, I should say. Um, and maybe it could include also summer programming, to which we do have our, um, our um, excuse me, our summer learning academy. Um, that would be beneficial for sustainability because that's currently grant funded. Um, but these are all hope for us. We won't know until officially the state produces the document that says here's what you have to live by. We just know that's against the plan current ones. So good evening, I will go through our instructional budget. Um, the salary related items you'll see on the next slide as usual, so I'll hold off on that particular item momentarily. Contractual, you'll see an uh, increase there. There's been shifting around some monies. Recall that contractual conferences, supplies, and equipments encapsulates all seven buildings plus the Educational Support Center. So it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of different factors um, that are involved in each of these, um, those four first items after salary. Uh, this one particularly includes our SRO contract, which we know we are doubling our number of SROs, and that's going to be reflected in this contractual line. 
So we had money coming in and out as uh, money shifts in the building level, as well as the educational support level for certain um, needs. And then we do have a, a demand there for our SRO that was between double from three to six anticipation for the contract. Conference has laid itself flat there. Um, supplies, again, just some shifting around that's occurring for that $14,000 ad. Um, this includes you know, building level classroom, office, postage, paper, which we've seen increasing costs on, um, and general office supplies. So just get some shifting of monies, no additional money being added, just between those lines. Uh, equipment is one that had some shifting, but it also includes a consideration I'll discuss later on. Uh, we are putting up for consideration a one-time $20,000 ad to our music department to buy instruments. And I'll get more into detail when I get to that particular consideration slide. BOCES, as we've been mentioning in previous um, presentations, we did see a significant jump uh, in this particular line. Um, I'll give you the, the, the basics is the CTE um, program, the per, uh, student cost has gone up significantly to the cost of over $130,000 for that line alone. Other increases uh, amount to the alt ed programming uh, for middle school as well as the high school. Um, slight increases in our STEM kits and um, other co-service like uh, ADL, our venture-based learning, um, and um, co-service related to education and the implementation of some of those programs. So a um, lot of shifts there, but a big bulk of that being our CT. Tuition had a surprising increase. This is the money that the, specifically the charter school um, we paid the tuition. Uh, we have more students attending at a higher cost per year. So we see, we see a significant raise there due to that. This line also <coughs> does include our foster care placement um, tuition in that line for students that are in foster placement in good other districts. Lastly, a slight increase in textbooks, and that's a per pupil allocation based on that day. Um, that's a, a state guided number. I think it's still $58 and change per, per, per pupil that we get. Before I move on to salaries, questions on those items? Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious with the proliferation of um, electronics and computers and tablets and all that. What constitutes the definition of a textbook nowadays? Is it my understanding of what a textbook was from back in the Stone Age, or is it a different thing? Yeah, it's anything a student puts their hand on. So we could expend workbooks out of this. We could expend, and there's also um, um, your traditional textbooks, as you would remember that. No, the state has not gotten us gotten generous enough for us to go in that direction for laptops and others. Don't think I don't push Mary and Bly every year and say, maybe we can purchase no, it's very specific and traditional definition still. Can you a <clears throat> Some people, hopefully. Other questions on those lines? All right, now we'll go down to the, the salary related items. This slide is broken up in numerous uh, different ways. Um, you'll see in those first, especially four lines, very changes in budget to budget, February to February. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about each one to make some understanding or provide some understanding. Um, know that these numbers being budgeted, um, FTE uh, has changed in some of them. Uh, we do have teachers that go between buildings and from year to year, and as, as some say month to month, depending on the need of the student, real may service, those FTE numbers adjust. Um, the biggest part of our pre-K-4 program is we did add, we had a plus three there from last year. Uh, we have three additional pre-K, and then we have some additional ads because we had saw more students in our E&L program in the pre-K through four. So those pre-K through four number FTE, if you compare it to last year, did go up, and that's reflected in those additions. Two at Gardner Road, I believe, one at Ridge Road ad, and uh, some E&L services switched down from our five through 12, and we're servicing our pre-K level. Uh, in addition, these numbers also um, would have um, anticipated breakage. We had an anomaly year, although I'm, I'm told every year to try to keep our new hires to a fresh out of college and, and for, for appropriate budgeting purposes. We have tended to take teachers from other districts at higher amounts in the last couple of years. Uh, it's great for us and our students. However, it does sometimes go against what we went allocated and, and the breakage for a particular line. <clears throat> you see especially that in our 9 through 12 line. Um, and, and some of the, the, the planning that was done there. 
So uh, also, um, section movements have not yet been accounted for. You know that we have pre-K and K registration going on, so those numbers of FTV could shift as well. I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later when we do considerations. <clears throat> we have normal contractual obligations for all the units represented on this slide uh, that go from, from year to year. Uh, in addition, um, let's see, we had a shift um, in instructional CTE, if you looked at year to year, went five to six. Um, if you remember, we, we had a family consumer science that we moved in, in Chris Earl, the high school principal, worked to, to make that science-based curriculum, and we actually had a science teacher in our CTE. Um, this year, we've been hired, able to hire um, a family consumer science, again, well-experienced um, person, and that is reflected up from five to six in that particular line. Uh, libraries uh, held the same, and counselors and clerical, if you look year to year, Sorry, I'm jumping around, but there was a related to that CTE, and I want to go back down to that. The, uh, the counselors, you'll see an increase there, one FTE, because we are carrying now our intermediate school uh, counselor that we added, we added to the budget. Uh, and then um, principals and clerical, averages remain stagnant. Our educational support does see a jump there. Um, we, I want to go through the positions that are included in that particular line. We'll have three considerations for new positions within that line. I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but right now, we do have a director of technology, uh, provided director of professional learning curriculum, our chief information officer, two instructional coaches, three clerical registrar, a grade supervisor, and myself. And then we'll have three additional positions that will be put up for consideration a new director and two new instructional coaches. Um, another jump you're going to see, last but not least, is the teacher assistants and teacher aides and monitors. Um, we went up from last year 6.17. This is uh, sometimes, when you see some of these point something numbers, they do turn out to be old people blue. Just trust us on that. It's just a TA there might spend time in special ed, and so they were reflected in Kelly's presentation when she did one of those special ed presentations. So all, they all add up. Also, monitors are not 1.0 FTE. They, they're less than, they're like 0.5 something day when you look at their hours. So they add up in an odd number as well. In the end, under the considerations, you're going to see uh, the going forward with four additional teaching assistants at the pre-K through four level. And three cafeteria monitors as well. Is that my consideration? So the ads there um, go to that. I believe I covered all lines of questions. Just for clarification, did you say Grand supervisor or grant? Yes. <laughs> grand supervisor, who is here tonight and probably doesn't want to be seen. Um, grand supervisor is a position we brought over from both seas to service the district full time rather than as a cost efficiency and also especially in the competitive grants. And Tom has mentioned before the huge lift we have with our electric, electric bus endeavor as well as other competitive grants we just haven't had time to get to to support our work and um, make sure we have sustainability in our programming. So uh, Stacy has joined us as part of the team just this past Monday. So we're excited to have her. She worked for both seasons. She's been in the district for eight years in that capacity, and that was full time with us. Yes. With the additional cost of the grant writer, have you projected any revenues coming from that? Well, we knew straight off, taking it back from BOCES, uh, uh, as we have in the past with other BOCES positions, we knew that there was a savings to a five-day-a-week structure, where we might have had Stacy and accompanying people at a cost of over 140000 I think it was, in that BOCES line, very little bit revenue-driven. Now we have someone in-house, and so we immediately saw a cost savings by bringing someone in-house. Now, seeing the efficiencies of doing the similar work she did before, before quite honestly, she'll still work and uh, oversee our grant funding and ensuring that I'm not spending, I'm spending within the limits of what we're supposed to spend these grants on, which includes everything from our SIRSA, our CARES Act that we had, to our Title I, II, III, IIA, IV, and a few others, um, UPK, which has significantly increased as well to support our pre-K program. So just to name some of them. So we have our, our traditional ones that she's overseen in the past partly, but now we'll get her full attention as a district employee, so we'll see the 
efficiencies and quickness of time for that. And then the competitive, which we never really looked deeply into, we expect to see the increased revenue with that. Um, we have to be careful of the sustainability. It's always great to get the money, but nothing's free when we look at the long haul. We've got to be very careful with electronic buses, of course, and we already have a working on a couple projects, including uh, electronic, um, help me out, say this. Yes. Records management. Um, we're required to move some stuff over to electronic files, and um, it would have to be a heavy lift one time in house to hire people to do that announce work. And she's switching out a grant right now to get some of our paper files switched over by regulation a little to electronic. So it's those small things that we just have had the time that have to be done, as well as those larger things like the electronic bus. On this particular slide. Do we, and this may not be something you do we know how many um, staff there are? Like, what is the representation of that FTE versus what our entire district is? <laughs> I, I, no, 
I have no issue with looking at that to see what our numbers and comparability are working with Caitlin. I mean, you know, we share the market drives things, and so would we be better off considering the possibility? I do believe we've made alterations in the last several years to this number. Thank you. We did increase the rates in um, July 2023 to be um, right on par with, with our peer districts. Um, it's just the case where there are there used to be principal certified substitute teachers that were out there in the world that maybe they didn't have a full time job. Um, that's not the that case anymore. So thank you. July last time, and I'm sure we'll revisit it again and again. It's not time for the considerations. We're going to start off with uh, three additional cafeteria numbers. The number, this is for elementary, so the number is three because we currently have one building that has one additional than the other three. So we're going to make them all have power and have a support in the cafeterias during lunchtime. Uh, we see this in talking with the principals as a, a definite need. And it's just in, in a lot of our, as a district, we've done well to focus our attention in the last several years addressing wellness, right? We've been talking about that, about the student wellness, um, and seeing our work through that multi-tiered system of supports, um, and then includes academics, behaviors, as well as um, you know, social emotional needs that, that, that they need all coming together to, to benefit the student. Uh, so we've seen additional staffing over the years in the form of the like, TA, social, uh, you know, um, MSWs, um, sorry, after social work. Um, we've had additions to RTI, IS counselor, nurse practitioner, SROs. Uh, we have recent connections with Pathways uh, for elevated, you know, clinical services within our buildings, and uh, we've been providing with that summer women academy I referenced earlier. So all, all these attentions that we've been given, we're about to seek to continue that line of uh, ads, and you'll see the first one, you know, being uh, people in, in, in that during that untra that transition time or not as structured time as a classroom in the cafeteria. You know, you know, being able to support and be able to go around with those additional cafeteria members. <coughs> also have in the um, four additional teaching assistants that I mentioned earlier for our elementary schools, again, um, giving additional support in those classrooms. Uh, we've added four last year, I believe, um, eight altogether, but four of them to um, uh, the secondary level. And I believe this, this even this past year, we did add even an additional one on top of that. So a total of nine and two years we've added. Uh, see, uh, so that would be just for the, those elementary and additional to each. Uh, we're looking to, Tom has talked for some time about this, the instructional coaches to support our curriculum work. We're coming to a point where it's a, it's a matter of capacity. We're tackling now, uh, you know, as you know, we, Charles talked PD on the underway, as well as uh, the science curriculum. Stay changing that on us in the future as we should bring in a science person in house at the very least to address and you know, look at the science, adjust the FOSS kits and what those look like moving forward and uh, building a better structure for science K through 12. Um, especially with the standards change that we've seen in the middle years. So being a focus. We also should look at the additional ELA and some study support to round out the uh, support office. These are HTA positions. Uh, to support the work of teachers uh, that being alongside um, and support and teachers. The next one is a director of curriculum, or to me, instruction. Uh, this particular position has a, a, a very um, um, duties uh, working with the administration to ensure the implementation of the district's curriculum and best practices and instruction, engagement, and student management. Um, plans, develops, and monitors our TSS, RTI, AIS program. And um, upfront work would be very heavy for this position on the consolidations of the three elementary buildings. Uh, this, this position would oversee those efforts and the communications of that endeavor. That is a huge lift that we have coming over the next two, three years, three years. And then, of course, it, we have to make sure we have a plan strategy looking even after that for those students and staff and those families uh, as we go into years four and five. So someone that's going to be up front with that and be the point person to assist with those matters. <coughs> uh, we also have this person overseeing our pre-K program, which we've seen grow in the, in the last several years, couple of years, and we look to continue to grow if possible. So what, what Tom's alluding to is that um, our plan is to be able to offer pre-K to every student by the cohort size 
by the time the building projects are done. Um, to, so that or we have 12 you know, sections of pre-K running in the district, if not more, to accommodate as many families and to get as many kids as we can at, at a young age. We know if we can get them in our building then, then we can definitely make strides when they come to kindergarten. Um, before they come to kindergarten, excuse me. So it, is, uh, it has been a goal and it is to vision and aspire to offer pre-K to every student in the district. Currently, we do have slight waiting lists. Um, there, are, there are a variety of different programs in the, in the community that to be aware of, um, but we would look to you know, provide a very uh, streamlined, seamless effort vertically from our pre-K to K and first K grade programming so that our students are ready and able to enter kindergarten. So that would be part of that position as well. And uh, lastly, we are looking for a one-time ad. You remember a couple years back we had a con seller agreement to which we bought, jeez, 40-something instruments, 60-something? There we go. Thank you, Colin. I knew you'd know them. I think mind. 75 instruments. And they really were intended to target students a need. And uh, Got, got our research program, uh, getting those, those instruments in the hands of those fourth and fifth graders. But what we're finding happening in talking to the department is they get on to five or six in grade, and then we're saying, okay, if you want to continue, you, we, you, you got to get your own instrument. We got to give these back to the fourth graders in, in need. So to, to reduce that, we want to get a, just a quick influx of, of instruments into the cycle, uh, and then to the tune of $20,000, one time add, to add to that cycle of instruments. So less likely to be taking hands of uh, instruments and setting the uh, hands of those sixth and seventh graders. <clears throat> so now on this list, another considerations I want to make sure we talk about. It. It's within the budget, but important to note. We've had a lot of conversations about um, our FTSS, our supports that we offer students from some of the wellness and social emotional that I mentioned earlier in the behavioral and the academic. Um, we know that we have a rich tier one intervention system. We know that we with over the years have been able to add uh, RTI support. Um, one thing that we've been thinking about as we look to um, interventions is math. Uh, we do find that we have some strong RTI, we do have strong RTI, but we also have you know, two RTI providers in each building plus one that splits time between two buildings and associated TAs with those. So we have a, a, a good amount of the, those supporting our, our reading program, which is important. It's a fundamental need of the district. We also would like to expand that and start looking at math RTI and what that looks like. Um, we have pre-K and K numbers coming in, and if we do see efficiencies and abilities to in section numbers because of, uh, we could look to um, not, uh, not have, still have this, the appropriate number of kindergarten and pre-K, but shift the position possibly over to a math RTI and look, look to support our math RTI. There also could be considerations of looking at our ARP monies but we have to remember that it'll be a one-time flow that we're gonna to have to pick up operationally in the following year. So uh, if, if, I know it's been a conversation we've had in finance and as a board in our, in our conversations after uh, and hearing from staff, we wanna make sure that we little, little focus to our math RTI program. We've been supporting and, and putting together a, a social emotional. We're gonna keep doing that with our master social workers that we can talk with them. I think we need to turn some attention to our math work and what does that look like to support that program. Questions? Yes? Uh, could you be more specific about teaching assistance when you say elementary? Are you including pre K and 5 6 or just? No. Uh, sorry, my apologies. That's a K through 4. K through 4. And we also know we're trying to, as we talked about last year, getting for our buck in those, those primary years, especially, and assisting with, uh, with the teacher in the classroom in those younger grade levels, but not to discount fourth grade. Okay, so how many teaching assistants currently are in each of the elementary schools? I could not answer each building. Give you that information, but not tell that. I'm not referring to like specific teaching assistants who are part of an IEP or a specialized student. Understood. I'm just talking about that extra person that is there as a teaching assistant to help the classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm just setting up because Tony earlier indicated that this will be eight. This will actually now with these four, and yeah, well, it's the nine, but it's, this will bring it to 12. Oh, yeah. 
So what happens was is at the past two budget seasons we've done it and you asked this question. Here. <laughs> and what happens is, is yeah, the district has always been trying to say each year we're taking a little yeah. more of a step. The first year we had four and we said, hey, we can use them half and half. I think administrators and teachers try to do the best they can. The next year we added the four, which was last year, that brings it to eight. We added another one along the line because there was a need. One of our buildings is a little bit larger and uh, different needs there. So our plan was to come again this year, build it to 12. It won't meet all of our needs, but it's moving in the right direction. We plan on doing this the next two budgets. By getting to that point where we will be 12, then the 16, then the 20, in that third budget, when I believe we consolidate the three, we would be at anywhere from 20 to 24 teaching assistants for three buildings. Eight per building, which depending what we feel the need is going to be, if you have eight and there's naturally four sections at each as long as it plays out that way, eight would virtually cover kindergarten or first grade. We don't know what the need is in second grade, but we may look at it all, an option of kindergarten, one, first and second grade, half and half, but then we'll evaluate it and see if we need to move further, further for that next grade. But like we said, we're on a path to try to do that over time. And we've stuck to it for the past three years, so this is adding, I think, what the board, as well as you, has said that is something that we want to strive for. I appreciate what you've done. No problem. They all need it, I know. Okay. Um, so. So what was the year that you say you're going to keep going? 20, it's 2025 is when we consolidate. I think during that budget, we will still probably need to do another four. We're trying to get to that 2024 because if, if you have a perfect four section per building, that means you've got 12 and 12. 12 and 12 is 24. That's all buildings, at least kindergarten and first grade, that could potentially have an assistant by that time, unless there's a need, say, half time first grade, half time second. But we'll look at that when we get Just to. doing the math to see whether or not yeah, we have to run again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a good math. Good job. Yes, you have to. Yes. So I hope that answers the annual question. And that's what our intervention. Yeah. I'm going to get a t-shirt. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. So the cafeteria monitors, the population in our elementary schools right now is not equal. Mm -hmm. If we're going to equal out the number of adults, would it then, what, this what's the ratio we're trying to achieve? Because that's a lot of tiny humans in sure. I want to say ratio is one thing, but size of the cafeteria as well, okay. and the number of sections that come in and out based on the schedule of them are all variables to consider. So it, it, I could get, get you a ratio, we can say, okay, you got three, and three cafeteria monitors, we got X number, but that doesn't help you when you talk about, do I, when am I just starting, how many sections go through, how many sections are in that cafeteria at one time, depends on different to each building, it could be different. So um, a lot of variables there. I do think that this is a great preparation for that consolidation effort as well, um, when we know we're going to need that support. Um, I think they can use it now to help them focus on that unstructured time of uh, students in the cafeteria. Tentatively, I believe, is if these are added, I think across the four, we would have 16. When you consolidate down, you still have that number. And then for the instruments, is there budget consideration for replacement of instruments? Um, so if we add these 20 on, is there the ability to pay for changing that? Yeah, no, great question. So um, some of those go are giving the opportunity to influx that equipment line already in the music department, because we knew that console would be a, a, a burden to, to get, uh, catch up with. We can evaluate that year to year. We always do to say, okay, we got a lot more instruments coming off cycle and beyond um, repair. Um, I have talked with the, the department chair about um, just this music in our month. Uh, this was in March. Um, but there was considerations of a spring clean instrument donation that could also 
schedule, but I, I, we, we had a hard conversation about we're not taking junk though. We don't want to ask them. We're just going to have to fix it or recycle that down the line with a shorter replacement cycle. But we do get a lot of years out of the instruments. But I would serve, every year I meet with the chair to talk about what we need, and that's where this particular at. So to answer your question, we would have to consider it sooner or later. Okay. Instruments have different lifespan depending on the instrument, too. And the child. The child. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and then for pre-K, is there consideration about extending that day to make it more accessible for more families? Yes, that would be a consideration. Tony, can, can you uh, speak again to the instructional coaches mm -hmm. in terms of, I know you said this, but I, I think I missed it. I'm curious about sort of, are these folks that have a teaching background that would be moving into that role? Are they compensated similar to teachers? Are they full time? Can you say a little bit more exactly about what Absolutely. Um, a couple years back, we brought these positions in house from OCs. Um, we, we used to purchase this service through, through the OCs closer. Um, we found value to have someone five days a week rather than having to have them detached from us and from our culture. So we brought them in and we brought two in-house. Um, we currently have two in the position, one in math and one in the ELA. They are members of the teachers unit with years of experience under their belt in particular fields. And they bring forth the instructional practices and the knowledge of the curriculum and curriculum development and a system work side by side with teachers to go through new standards, performance indicators, and what does this look like? What's the performance task? What do our assessments look like? You know, how do we layer the curriculum appropriately? And where do we start? How do we work with special ed? And what does that look like? So they have a lot of, a lot of folds into their work. Uh, a lot of it is professional uh, learning that they do and offer, as well as side by side, just let's get the work done and come in together. They are teachers, members of the unit, and kind of sit on that same scale. And then, so we have to, we'd be adding two more. Correct. And are they assigned you know, by grade level, or how would, how would that then get divvied up? I'd love to get there. Right now, we just have a math and an ELA, and I kind of have to run the K through 12 experience. Yeah, I say when you add two more, what's your Yes, reason for science. We, we have a heavy lift in science. We want to revisit the FOSS and our FOSS kits and the work that we're doing with our early primary levels through the eighth grade. And then we also know that the middle grade levels right now are adjusting, and New York State is changing their assessments at the um, at the region's level in the coming years. So we want to have someone in place to help that development to ensure teachers are ready for that transition to assist students be successful. So ultimately, is it fair to say these are positions that you think, I mean, help enable teachers to be able to do their job, you know, and are a value add in that regard? I do. Okay. And then, this is more of a general question. I'm curious. How do you um, determine, so I've, you know, the FTEs that we have across different grade levels from an instructional standpoint, do we, is that tied to, you know, a number of students? And so, in other words, we're not adding any teachers as part of this. And do we look at the number of teachers per students and kind of maintain, we know what we need and that's what determines whether or not we have to add? Yeah, so specifically you're thinking about the K through the four, the K through six, that um, the, the numbers of at those building levels more or less. Our seven through twelve um, has the same, you know, we have a trash obligation as far as class size, but they are um, static programs and schedules often. We offer varying things year to year, on and off, and nine through twelve that might be different, but seven eight has a pretty solid structure of the requirements of the department of regs. They have to teach certain things that's required. We'd love to move that step down to sixth grade, but Right now, it's a seven and an eight, and they have heavy schedules. Okay. So, um, but as far as the uh, pre-K and K specifically, is where we have the ability to look at, you know, changes in needs, as well as you'll remember we had conversations here about our current uh, two current grade levels in the district who had um, students come in during the summer to which we moved the students to another building. It's the following year; those students, by policy, have to go back to that building. So I know I have to add sections to those. But they're coming from another building who might have exited a fourth grade section with had four sections in it. And the incoming kindergarten only needs three. So this one teacher is now, there's a position of FTE floating in that building that might not land anywhere, but because I have to add over here, it, they'll, someone will land there, I'm not sure who. So they, they get moved around, especially in the pre-K K through four. Pre-K is dictated a little bit differently. They are class size 18 by the grant requirements. Uh, there's different rules and regulations that go with their time and day. 
Uh, but again, we don't see a high number of parents register their pre-K numbers, then we have to evaluate how many pre-K teachers we have this year and how many we need next year, given the interest from the community. So those numbers also can be adjusted to move either to support sections that are all of a sudden going over the class size limits at the pre-K through six, or K through six, or as the thought I had earlier, just provide to maybe do a math intervention or something to support the math curriculum. Okay, that's helpful, thank you.
supplies and traction equipment. We have a minor twenty two thousand dollar budget for such items. And then our BOCES budget, um, as we've seen before, we're seeing increases in our BOCES. So in the business office budget, things like our internal auditor is budgeted in this line, our financial software is in this line, our tax service through BOCES, um, our cognitive purchasing, Medicaid service. Um, and we have to do, according to governmental accounting standards, an annual report on our post-employment benefits, all through both these included in this number. We have seen increases in our financial software, our Medicaid service, um, and every year we have to do uh, the alternate, uh, we have to do a full valuation, excuse me, of our post-employment benefits. So that went up to 6000 So included in my salary number, I actually have a budget consideration this year. Um, I would be asking the board to consider the addition of an accountant. Um, we have done a great job building our own in-house business office, um, but we're reaching to the point where we're, we're doing so much more than what we've done in the past that we're it's necessitating the need for an additional accountant. Um, one, to manage the workload that we have, and two, for some future planning. Um, we may have someone meeting us in a couple years, and we need to start that planning process now. This position could absorb those duties um, at that time in a couple of years. If I can add, what Katie's talking about is we have an individual who's dedicated their life to the district for 40 something years as our accountant. A wealth of knowledge and does everything. To all of a sudden have that shift, succession planning is becoming very much important. The individual also knows this as well and shares the gift of their knowledge over several years so that basically our business office would have a seamless transition. In a couple of years, you would see a reduction in this potentially, unless more work keeps adding up. Um, but you definitely see major breakage in this or a reduction as that potential future succession. Any questions on the business office budget? All right, so that's I, a problem. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I just want to make sure I'm clear. So, did you say that the salary for the proposed additional accountant was already reflected in the previous slide? Yes. Okay. If all budget considerations have been added in right up front versus adding them in as we, as we go. <coughs> So now we're going to go through the work that has been happening over the last couple months to drain the budget uh, back in line. Uh, so adjustments to revenue that have occurred. Um, we did receive um, from the February database additional state aid. I added $88,000 to our um, state aid budget. Still so holding back at $175 um, until we get uh, further guidance whether or not that is that set aside is remaining or if it's free for general purpose. Um, I've added 196000 in interest income. Um, given the current interest rate market, it's advantageous for us at this time to invest um, cash we have on hand. So our plan is um, once our tax collection money starts um, coming in September and October, we're going to invest in a fairly large CD um, through the remainder of the school year um, to have that CD mature in June when um, our big cash flow needs occur in June. Uh, so with that, we can budget $196,000 for that anticipated CD income. Interest income, 50000 this is just the um, increase in income that we see in our typical deposits. And a uh, small $2,000 in the plane adjustments, so revenue was adjusted up $337,000. Expenditures. Um, salary items, this is always one of the, the bigger items that gets adjusted. Again, we rolled the budget in February. Um, it's a starting point. We have, to, we have to call at some point, so we're building the budget with something, and then we adjust down from there. So included in that $1.3 million in salary items is around $500,000 in sales and breakage. This could be from uh, announced retirements, um, resignations that we've received, any type of um, you know, movement in positions where salaries change to be accounted for um, in that number. Um, also included in that number, we have over time accounted for in the general fund salaries that are um, paid through our, our grants 
that we receive our, our title grants and our, our special ed grants. And that, that purpose of that was to uh, kind of protect those positions in the event that those grants were to dry up. The title grants are, have been stable. They, you know, there hasn't really been any risk of those going away. So we are comfortable adjusting those, um, I don't say protected salaries, but the salaries that we've been holding in both places, um, comfortable releasing those in the general fund payment strictly out of the federal fund. Um, in the effort to bring the budget uh, back in line, we did look internally at the budget considerations that we've presented to date. Um, and we can offer a few solutions in order to get as many of these as we can. So the four teaching assistants, we can build, uh, we can shift over from the general fund to our ARP funds. We currently have some TAs um, coming out of our, I believe, our third of federal pot of money. These four TAs could be paid out of the ARP pot of money. We would do with these TAs like we did with the, the initial four that are out of SIRSA. We would build them in the budget over time to have that sustainability plan. SIRSA ends in September of 23, ARP ends September of 24, so we want to make sure we have that plan to continue having those positions on our books. Uh, the three uh, cafeteria monitors that we discussed, those could be shifted and made out of the school lunch fund versus the general fund. Uh, we've had further conversations about the instructional coaches, and we um, could adjust the two coaches down to one instructional coach. I believe Tony with the focus on science, this will be the goal. And then other adjustments in that salary line are um, some general purpose things, overtime, extra pay, uh, sub pay, looking at trends, looking at budgeted items, and making sure that they're in line. Um, so that number is all just the pure adjustments, it doesn't represent any loss of positions or things. Uh, GST BOCES is down 478000 um, Again, doing a review of all BOCES COSERs, making sure that things are budgeted appropriately. Uh, we did end up uh, reducing the special ed portion of our BOCES budget down a little bit. Um, that does not compromise the students that we're serving. Um, it's just looking at historical trends of what we've had to budget for BOCES versus what actually goes out the door. Uh, there was an adjustment to the BOCES administrative budget, uh, reducing that piece down by $100,000. BOCES themselves have changed how they manage their own cash flow, um, so they've made uh, some adjustments to a revenue and participation note that they, they issued, which impacted our interest expense, actually bringing it down to the benefit of our district. Um, another reduction in BOCES, uh, Bill Giant Coley has presented that we added $50,000 to the BOCES line for Promethean Board replacements. That is money that we can shift over to ARP and pay that $50,000 increase through the ARP funds. Uh, supplies, contractual and equipment. Um, there was adjustments such as um, we were able to bring our fuel expense down a little bit. We had our fuel bid open after uh, the budget was initially set. So based on the rates of our gas and our diesel, we were able to bring that down a little bit. Um, there were some contracts that we uh, have in place for our new preschool program um, that don't need to be budgeted for in the general fund. They're paid for out of our special aid funds. We could reduce those down. Uh, Caitlin had presented during her presentation about um, our healthcare consultant, not healthcare consultant, our affordable care consultant, Paragon, to looking to phase away from them. Um, we're still working on the termination, um, ending that contract now. Uh, but worst case scenario, we have to keep them on the books between now and December, so I was able to uh, record a savings from January through June. They run on a calendar year contract. We had a $60,000 uh, one-time ad in our budget for the upgrade of our radios. That initiative is done. The radios will be purchased, but we can move that one-time pot back out. And then just a review of all departments um, and district level uh, contractual lines to review trends, make sure they're all in good order. Uh, benefits, as I mentioned before, Social Security, ERS, TRS are constantly being fine-tuned as salaries change, the, uh, the district's responsibility for those contributions changes as well. And this also accounts for um, a decrease in the stop loss insurance premium that we had initially budgeted based on the good news that we're, we're receiving now. And then previously mentioned, $250,000 transfer to capital. It was initially our goal to uh, build that line back up. So once we, um, oh gosh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. 
Um, our initial million dollars, we were dedicating that money towards um, the debt of our $122 million that is still the plan. Um, and we were looking to replenish that line so we still had a source of funds available for uh, small capital improvement projects. Uh, but we can reduce that down from 1.5 to 1.25 and still do some decent annual projects. So total adjustments on the extent side total $2.7 million. Still in the Daphne band comparison here, so I apologize if this chart's a little cluttered. Uh, so top top blue boxes, if we're considering the Daphne option, the gap initially was $9.1 million. If we take into account the revenue and expense adjustments we just went through, that brings the gap down to $6 million. Taking into account the levy increase that, that correlates with Daphne brings that gap down to $2.2 million. On the fan side, same story. The initial uh, gap was $8 million. With those adjustments, it comes down to $4.9. With the corresponding tax levy change, it comes down to $2.2. So this illustrates what I, I said early on, that the, the Daphne ban scenario is gap neutral. Once you apply the, the appropriate tax levy to it, either scenario, we have a $2.2 million uh, gap at this point. So if we were to use the same level of reserves and fund balance as we have in the last few years, that gap for either scenario comes down to just shy of $700,000. Summary of funded expenditures. This updates the chart you saw earlier on in the presentation. This is uh, information as of today. Um, so total expenditures with the, the debt the option you go up 6.9 million dollars or 7.88 percent total expenditures on the band cycle of 5.5 million or 6.31 so we still have that gap of seven hundred thousand dollars we are still reviewing all of our tools um, waiting on that final state budget to see what opportunities we have there uh, we do have the opportunity to use additional reserve funds to close this gap i'm going to continue um, reviewing the budget with a fine tooth comb to find other budget reductions. Um, but the budget at this time does uh, one, include all the budget considerations we've talked about today, and two, maintain all of the same programs. Any questions? So, The revenue side under the DASM, does that assume we're going out at the highest levy? And are we as a board going to discuss if that's our choice to go out at the highest levy possible? That is coming in a little bit out of a discussion. DASM and band needs to be sort of pointed and decided for our direction to get ready for the next <clears throat> budget session on the third, I think it's the 13th. There's also, you know, we can do reductions, we can bring it down, we also have debt service. I don't, have you gotten to that yet? Yes, you did. We can use debt service, we can use more reserves, so we do have tools. We have probably our thoughts of where you should go to. We are trying to stay as staff strong as we can as long as we can. We don't want to go there at this point. If our tools run out, that's where we go. We're trying to avoid stay staff strong where we are right now. So as we go through this, we'll have that discuss discussion because we have some of the thoughts of bringing that down. That's why that DASNI and BAN are important. Once we make that decision between DASNI, which started out, I think, Right now it's at about 8.9. What's it? We have that slide that shows you where we're at. 8.34. If I wrote it down, probably yep. 8.34. Just got to find the slide. Which one are you looking for? You're looking for the one with the, the rates? The one with the rates was the new one. Point, I know, 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 I
And what happens, that was with the debt service and, and stuff. That was that slide. So you have it under your, your page. And Warren, you, I think that's the one I heard. Is this the one here? Yes. yes. Okay, if you look at that. If you look at this with the dad's name, this column here says right now where we're at to get to the end without any debt service. We're either looking if we go DASNY at 8.34 or BAN, a uh, rate increase of 5.67. This is the levy increase, but remember, this is the 2% number. When you see 9.05, that is New York State's 2% maximum calculated tax levy that the governor, when he put it in, said this is acceptable for each. Just like this is the same exact 2% number using the bank. The rate is what actually impacts the, the tax base. So those are both where we're starting. We are probably going to come back to you and say last year we used 630000 in debt service. We have that resource to help our community. So if we go DASNY, we're looking at about 7.54. If we go BAN, we're looking at about 4.85. Definitely a change. But that is the new 2% number using that debt service. Debt service is to help the local tax base to control that spice in sort of peaks and valleys and so forth. So what happens is, depending on these two numbers, will determine what the rate is. Remember, when I started here, it was 1830. Last year, we saw a significant 7% decrease in our tax rate. We're seeing that that was probably too big of a dip at that time with the budgeting to what was going on that you're going to have sort of peaks and valleys. We're at one of the developing peaks right now that if, say the board went with the, with the ban and we did everything and closed that gap and say we we're at 4.17 and this isn't final yet because it's still, and this is a conservative estimate. Every time Katie pretty much has given this estimate for both of these numbers, the final number has actually come in lower than even these numbers. But we always rather be conservative with it. So this rate right here is about 64 cents on the thousand, or would interpret to $64 for a $100,000 value house. The other side would be a dollar nine, or about $109 per $100,000. That's how we communicate because that's really the impact. So what we're looking for throughout the course of this is we really need to know, are we going to go DASNY or are we going to go BAM? Ultimately, all these numbers will change over the next couple of weeks, especially with the assessment information. This sets our course. So A, we know where we're going, and B, we get rid of one or the other option. And that's what we need the board to decide tonight. Yes. When we're looking at debt services, how deep is that well and how many times can we go back to Right now it's $5.8 million we can only use for this type of resource. Yeah. In other words, I could cover the whole debt by doing it in one year. Right. Wouldn't it be wise? And you have to remember, as Katie can explain much more eloquently than myself, the more debt service we use, next year's tax cap goes up even higher. So you want to try to make sure that you're trying to stay steady and then draw off of it. Uh, going from year to year, we can recover that 630 just from the way that premiums come in. Uh, we could go higher. Look, at, if you go higher with that debt service, that number's coming down. But next year, that number's going up. We'll probably play with this once you tell us there to try to get the best we can put out that tries to minimize impact to rate as best we can. But just so the board knows, this whole board, previous boards have done a hell of a job in eight years because taxes are down from 1830 down to 1604 right now, even with the increase, with all of our construction, 
right now with the band where it is, we're still below seventeen dollars. No other school district that we compare against Elmira Heights, Corning, and uh, Elmira, I believe, are under nineteen dollars at this point. Other questions? Adam? In the previous budget meeting, it seemed that the consensus of the board was for Dazney. Now, in this slide here, you present that the 630000 is static used between Dazney and Van. It would be an option to increase the use of that service if we pick Dazney to somewhat bridge the gap between the 6.84 and the 4.17, correct? Yes, that is, that is an option. However, like the warning, is next year where that 9% is there, I think Katie's already done a potential run, it will be up over 11% next year that you'll have to look at, and then you won't have any of these options. Except either raise the tax, raise the rate, which I still believe would be below where we're at, I can't guarantee that, or we're going to have to look at all of our budget and then look at the tools that will solve that problem. Mr. Chris. On the subject of Dazney versus Van, and I think I agree with, with Kevin, I think, and I spoke in favor of Dazney at the last meeting, but I've been thinking about it, and you know, it's interesting to see that it ultimately becomes gap neutral. So essentially, we, we deliver the same services and maintain the same staff irregardless of which we pick. Really what it is is the impact on the taxpayers, the way I see it. And uh, as we talked about last time, you know, the, I guess the risk of DASD, I'm sorry, the risk of ban is that interest rates increase and we're not locked in. I'm not an economist, but it feels like uh, interest rates are maybe not gonna continue to increase in the way that they have been given what's happened most recently in the market. Um, and I think it's not an immaterial difference to taxpayers to have almost a 3%. I know these are all, uh, you know, estimates and caveated, but if you look at 4.1 you know, 4 to 6.8, that's a 2.5, two, two, you know, plus difference, right? So what I'm thinking about is in terms of trying to minimize the burden on the taxpayers and still deliver the same um, services, is it worth the ban for a year, recognizing that next year we could always, if I understand correctly, lock in to DASNY at that point? You can do two more years of a ban. So you can do this year. You could even have that option next year. You could do DASNY this year. You could do DASNY the next year. You have those options. But by that last year, you're either locking in everything and, or DASNY. No matter what, there's no more bands. Is it okay? Thank you. And so, just a few other thoughts. Now, obviously, you know, others. But is there any way we can get some um, projections from fiscal advisors as to what they think about interest rates? You know, they will not. You have to understand. They put their credibility on the line, and they can't have a crystal ball like we can. Yeah, that is the hard part. Uh, I think we all watch it a little. Uh, it's one of my major activities that I have to sort of do every day or at least every week because it does impact construction, impacts our budget, impacts our borrowing. Uh, right now, hypothetically, there's some saying out there that there may be one more rate hike up to three, but there's also some indicators saying that there might be one and that rate hike is going to be leveled off. There probably won't be a cut this year but they are heavily forecasting to cut by the end of the first quarter or second quarter of next year, and then there will be a reduction. It, it, no matter what, our economy and economic outlook is cyclical. Yeah. But the hard part is something else could happen. Right, right. So, so I guess, uh, in summary, I am strongly supportive of maintaining, as you said, staying staff strong, program strong, no, not cutting, maintaining. And when I think of DASNY versus BAN, it's not really a question of that, because we can maintain with either. 
it's really a burden on the taxpayers. And frankly, I get concerned given how people are suffering economically if we go out with a budget that's at you know a notional nine percent levy increase as to whether how that would be received. So six point three looks better than nine point oh five. Yeah, and I'd be in favor of using the debt service as we did in the past right. to lower it to four to under five percent. So. And we might be able to play with that still. These are these are just the rough numbers right now. Uh, like as Katie said, we have one whole town that's working on their assessment that could impact it. We just don't know. So yeah, in summary, I think I'm sort of reconsidering the Van Gazzy question in light of, of that and uh, I think it's worth contemplating is Van a good idea for a year to, to help make sure that the budget is successful and that we're not burdening taxpayers. So, Mr. Christmas was kind of just said what I've been thinking for this presentation. <laughs> I, was, I think I was the first person to say something in favor of Gassy last time. Um, and I guess my only point is yeah, for all the reasons that Mr. Christmas said, those numbers with the debt service and the demand combination, that we still got the past budget the majority. If, if we, even if we go out at the 4.85 number, um, that that has a much better chance of passing in this community than it has uh, any level or with or without that service. So I think I am also trending to expand the equation. Go ahead, Warren. Do we have any sense of? I mean, the Fed just raised it a quarter point. Um, do we have any sense for every quarter point that's raised what it would cost us in additional expenditures? Because the ban is tied to every short-term note, right? Isn't that the way I understand it? We're subject to um, fluctuations. It's in not interest rate right? under the... So under the band, correct? Under the DAS, it's a fixed rate. Is that it's accurate? It's fixed per year. Yeah. So when we borrow in June, whatever the rate is at that time, that's our rate for the for the year of the borrowing. And then when it's time to renew the band, if we opt to renew the band, then the rate resets at the current market rate. It's not like an adjustable mortgage where it can go up month to month. We set it for a year, and that is where it's set for that year that resets the next year. The, the issue with the ban is, although we have those quarter point rates, it does not necessarily transfer to that's the rate the schools and government agencies are going to get. Like right now, the interest, the interest rates out there are up near seven, eight percent. Ours are around four, four and a half. So although it's going up, we have a different sort of bonding market than like regular business, regular corporations. Uh, but we would be able to check and try to bring that back. But we, what your experience has been low. And our credit worthiness remains very stable. I just did a call with uh, as the people to do our, our bond rating anticipation for uh, our bus bond that we're selling on the market next week. And they reaffirmed our rating as A plus. So, um, still a very stable credit risk. Which that's favorable whenever we go out to borrow, as well as the premiums that come back to the district. I was not at the last meeting, so I didn't uh, have any input one way or the other, but after hearing the presentation tonight, I would definitely, and many of the reasons Dan mentioned, I would prefer the ban. I think we have some flexibility, you know, given that we can go to DASNY within the next year or two also, which I think is very uh, favorable in case there is not a, a potential drop in interest rates. I would hope they would stabilize within the next 12 to 15 months and hopefully start decreasing too. So I think I think the band's the right way to go. I like the ability to go under 5%. I like the, the number ending up under $17, which is a pretty remarkable number as you look at all the um, surrounding districts and there are some some are approaching $24, $25 per $1,000, and if we're still under $17, given all the projects that we've done the last couple of years, too, I mean, I think it's really remarkable. So I would strongly prefer going up with the band number. Others? Because you're giving, you start, I'm starting to hear a direction, but I need to make sure. 
I agree with what Brian and Ann Doc have said. I'm not going to repeat all of that. But I think, you know, right now I think we have a very positive kind of thought pattern from the community, the, the construction, the, all of that has gone well. I think there's a lot of good thoughts. But I also, what Dan referred to as the economic status of people who truly are struggling. And as Doug said, I hear I'm repeating, <coughs> we have to pass the budget. So I would vote for the ban. You didn't repeat anything I said. <laughs> 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 I'm selected. Fair enough. Tom? <laughs> I, would, I would say the same thing. I'm not going to repeat the same thing that everybody else repeated here. I thought it was very well said. You know, for, for all those reasons, I would, I would also choose the ban, although that is going against my conservative approach when it comes to this kind of stuff. I'm usually not a gambling person when it comes to numbers like this. But I do think in light of all the things that said, that makes the most sense right now. So, from hearing from everybody, we are moving to the bank. At the next presentation on the 13th, I don't know how many clicks I got to do, <laughs> but at the next presentation on the 13th, we will take DASNY off the board and put the band up there and work off those numbers. And our goal is to try to, again, stay staff strong, close the gap, uh, as we try to do this morning. I think you want to say something. Well, my question was, um, you indicated that all of the asks are included in the budget, so all of those asks created um, a nine million dollar gap or eight million dollars based on the gas near the ban. Um, no, if I can correct, please. The ads did not create the nine million dollar gap. Our entire operation did that. What happened was the ads total about 450000 over this budget. So even if we cut all of them, we're still $200,000 short right now as it stands. But we've taken some of those ads and moved them outside the budget already. So like the four, I think it's the four teaching assistants, the coach, one coach, and the three monitors. They're already removed from them. So they're something that we'll have to build in and support, otherwise we lose them the next year. So it's a tool we have because of that federal money to make sure that we can sort of borrow for another day to put it into the budget. All right, so with that said, I understand the district's position is they want them all of those <laughs> things. I guess I would like to see some sort of chart that shows what all of those costs are, and then at the board level have a discussion of the opportunity costs and trade-offs of if we have this, we could lose that. Um, if we have this, if we don't have this, maybe we want something different. I don't know, it just seems I'm going to vote on a budget and all of the asks, I don't even know what they cost us. So ultimately, I don't know what it costs the taxpayer. Right now, and I'm trying to understand what you're saying, but right now the ads in there are what, about 240000 or something? I'm just doing rough. I think once we remove let me see if I can find the sign. No, but I guess my point is, if we're saying we want to hire two ice cream salesmen or two cafeteria workers, and ice cream salesmen are 20 bucks, and cafeteria workers are five bucks, maybe we want more cafeteria workers and no ice cream salesmen. You, know yeah, you, you did horse trade, so that's no problem. Well, but I don't know what's on the chart to horse trade. Okay, well, right here, I'm showing you, okay? The additional account is about seventy thousand dollars. There's a chart time yeah. if you keep charging. Okay, good. See? Forward. You going forward? Yes. Mm -hmm. You're back. There you go. Keep going. Good. We did that piece. Yeah. Dormitory authority, so we have that answer. Uh, that's the Dasney. Keep going. 
Cafeteria. There we go. Cafeteria monitors that are covered by grant funded, so they're out. That was like 480 for, I believe, all of this, wasn't it? Uh, 404, I believe, was the, the total. And so the cafeteria monitors are shifted over to our or Cafeteria monitors are to the school lunch fund. School lunch fund. So the teaching assistants are over to ARC. And as we brought in the four from last year into this budget, next year we'll bring the ARC ones into the budget the same thing step through. The bus monitor is in this. That is. We, we were preparing that number for the next. So the salary is around $22,000. Yep. Instructional coach? Uh, around 60, 50, 60. Yeah. Director of instruction? Uh, 100, 120. Accountant? Uh, 60 to 70. Musical instruments? 20. Athletic instruments? 15. That's pretty much everything, right? Okay. Other than that, the only other horse trading is out of our actual general operations staff and uh, staff administration equipment and that. And I think we have some open custodial positions that we've just not built. And so. when these budget considerations lists are compiled, they are the result of the conversations which Tony and I have at the beginning of the process when we meet with all supervisors, we meet with all principals. Um, what, what are you seeing as need? What are your asks? And we make a, a, a list that we review and present forward. The big, the big thing is the reason why we put everything up front is because we needed to know if this year especially how big that gap was with the gas in the bank. Because look at I can take all these out. That's one percent. What's left is about one percent of that levy, if that, or, or the rate. Because one percent is well, it's not even one percent. It's half a percent. Because one percent of our levy is about 430000 440000 What's left is about 250000 So that's about half a percent is the only thing that is being considered into the budget. Um, if we wanted to reduce it more, we can reduce it more. That is up to the board. And that is sort of our question. Is there anything? Because the budget basically is built right now is, as far as we're concerned. Is there anything you missed? Is there anything you're opposed to? Is there anything you want us to add? And we do this every year. So. I might have missed a slide here, but if you go back, I'll go, back. go back to the gap, which shows $697,000. If I remember correctly from our last budget presentation, that number was like, huge before. And I know you cut some expenditures out of the budget, so how did you get all the way down to that? So it's the increase in the revenue, it's the decrease in the expenditures, and it's the use of our current levels of fund balance and reserves, and the incorporation okay. of the tax levy. There's some. All right, the fund balance and reserves. Okay, that's yeah. the part I didn't hear or see. Yes, so. using the same levels we've used in gotcha. you know, the past recent years, um, assuming that's the direction the board wants to go. All right, so that approximately 700000 is what we do with uh, fund balance and we do reserves. We can do reserves. You know, see the state or the state budget brings. Um, there's options still on the table. Okay. Are there other questions on this one? Or? No, uh, but if we're horse trading, <laughs> yep. I well, like, I'm not, but you. <laughs> I'd like the horse trade more um, focus on learning loss in the grade schools or delayed loss, whatever the current vocabulary word we want to use is. You're talking RTI? Uh, that would be a good word. Um, against some other things out there. Such as? Well, the most expensive item we put up there is $120,000, right? Yes, it is the director of instruction for elementary planning for the next two okay, years. Okay, but. I'd much prefer to see it go directly to students this year and next year, or next year and the year after, and build that into the next budget. That's my personal view. Oh, I, look at here's one of the things that's a tool, and Warren actually spoke very eloquently about it by doing it next year. I can cut it out of this budget, and then all of a sudden float it into next year's budget. We've done that with several positions. 
that's another tool. So uh, we try not to do it as much as possible, but if we have to, we've done that with coaching positions. We did that with the grant position that we folded into this budget. So those are options that we have. That's no problem. Tony, do you want to speak to RTI and what we have and maybe reassignment to some of our RTIs from building to building, which is not necessarily utilized? So currently, remember I mentioned we have dynamic TI providers in reading specifically and associated TAs with them. We currently work on an equity equal based system to which every building is assigned the same amount of RTI support. We have talked to finance about moving to an equity based where we as a district would draw a line and say here are students based on a variety of assessments and feedback that they should receive services at this, at this level. And therefore move staff around appropriately to those buildings rather than equal base and an equity based system. So we might be removing half time, a teacher half time in one building instead of having service another building because of the level of need determined as a district wide endeavor rather than equal to RTI providers and reading to each building. I still don't think it gets the math thing that I brought up earlier that we really should look at as, a, as another form of support that we should be offering. But there is that option to address equity.
on our website that's part of an accountability that you know Stacy and I now work on to, to ensure that we're meeting the need as according to that grant and our current targeting monitoring. But when we had adopted that, you might recall social emotional and technology were the top two by far, each at 40% or more as far as community saying we would like to see this money used for those two endeavors. So that's where our social work master's levels came in across the district and our huge influx to go to one to one, probably five through 12 next year, as well as having enough laptops in almost every elementary building, almost at one to one basically, because they want to be slightly down over the years. So we, we, we keep mentioning the ARP money because when the money was allocated and by the time we got through all the nonsense of the bureaucracy of getting the money in hand, almost a year had passed. And we had said we'd spend that first year money on some of those positions, but did not because, well, the, the bureaucracy was still occurring. So we had this money set aside that must be spent, but it's still only one-time money. So we could allocate it to purchase more technology, social, emotional, RTI services for an additional year. They're likely we currently pay one particular um, RTI provider through that grant uh, to flow between the two highest need buildings. We could look to that again to form our uh, RTI supports. The issue is it's a one-time. We have to be, what's, what's the sustainability? Certainly we can put it in place for next year. The money's there because of that first year gap and not spending that money as allocated by the state with time on the game. So we could allocate it, but we're gonna have to make that money up much like the, the teaching assistants and other positions. So we could look there as well as town. We have talked about the um, looking at the section numbers in our pre-K through So there's opportunity. We do have enrollment numbers that, you know, have, trending up and down over the, the years, that there are some considerations on certain models and certain buildings that we can look at in the future. But right now, I would think that that ARP, just as a caveat, we would have to think how to pick that up the year after. Our, our big thing is come Saturday, our enrollment locks. So come Saturday, our kindergarten enrollment and pre-K, first, second, third, we can lock it and then start addressing the budget as we need to. We still, even though it's locked, we still try to keep it open. But it is a tool that we have. Our biggest thing is we can have this, we can look at the tools, we can take something out and save it for the next year and still start it the same way. Um, so we have all those tools to try to address that. Yes. Just uh, the way I think of it, you know, we're maintaining the, the current status, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is critical. And then, like Doug said, you know, to me the list of, of uh, considerations is, is pretty small, and I defer to you know the, the principals and, and the staff members that said we need these things or we would like to add them. I mean, I are in the position to know how important they are, and it's not like a, a wish list of millions of dollars; it's a couple hundred thousand. So I mean, I'm inclined to support that, but at the same time, um, it did feel a little administrative heavy to me when looking at it, at least pieces of it. That's why I asked about the instructional coaches, because it wasn't clear to me, and, after, and the answer made it clear that you know they are direct supports to teachers, right? So I think that, that that was helpful. But to the extent that it's possible to make sure we're prioritizing something like RTI or additional you know, direct student type intervention support, I, I think that's a positive thing. But I'm also, to be clear, supportive of these because I think they're reasonable and there must be a need for them. Yeah, and, and I think you brought up a good point. Eight years ago, we brought, put up $1.9 million and added an instructional set regularly all the way through. We're going to have some administrative costs when we ship because 500, 550 elementary buildings are going to need more than just one principal. Uh, we're trying to prepare for that ship. That's why the instructional coaches with two, that's two instructional positions. The teaching assistants, although they're, although they're not the teachers in the room, they're supports. So we're looking at that as six. The bus monitors are on the transportation side, the cafeteria monitors are on the building side. So yeah, the two, the director of instruction and the accountant, one is for one or two years, the other is to formulate a re, re configuration of our entire elementary in less than two years. We sort of said throughout our instructional, they do a great job on the curriculum, they do a great job of trying to pull things together. The teachers have been doing a great job just trying to get the time while also teaching. He leaves it, there's only one. 
and the amount of work that's going to have to be done in a very short time is becoming quite challenging. That's why we talked about that earlier. So now the RTI, we'll go back and look at that. That helps us. Is there anything else we're missing? Oh, sorry. Oh, man. Um, is there anything that maybe clearly here there's no add-ons to what I would call direct social, social emotional support? Um, we talked about adding the MSWs and stuff like that. Is does the administration feel they're good with where they are position-wise? We with added, MS, yeah, we. You, added, I know you had. Yeah, we but added MSWs. You don't need any more additionals. What you're saying in this ask. You can always use more. Right. I'm just not going to give your pick, but there it is. It's like a baited question. You could always use more. Um, but well, that's the whole point of work training. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what I was saying. Um, the, the, we, we see the, the yeah. add-on of the instructional coach and the director of instruction. That could be there in lieu of some, another for that. Back to what, in the memory survey break, right? It was, the second most popular option in that survey back yes. from AR. Yeah, SEL, yeah. and that's why we invested in MSWs and yeah. counselors in each of our buildings and increasing it almost twofold. Isn't it? We're working towards two master level social workers in every building. Yeah. We're even helping as, as we go from social work assistance, we're replacing it with a higher individual and that's we're continuing that already. And I do want to uh, reiterate, we get to a point where what we can do as a district and what is appropriate as a clinical and non-district related item, but the students still need supports. And I mentioned earlier the connections we're making with pathways to get that higher level of service in here that we should not ever support. Yeah, yeah. We should not be doing the licensed social worker in that higher end, but making those connections so that students can get that those services in-house without having to employ it. We want the best for what we can afford. I can tell you from my colleagues out there, we have a much stronger system than most of them. And that's because of all your okay. I'm sorry, I just thought of one other thing I wanted to say, which I would commend the district on the work around the SROs. I think that's, you see in the news every day why unfortunately that's important. And I think that's, I know that's about a two hundred fifty thousand dollar add to the budget. Well, Did you actually, say? we've been in negotiation. It's been going up. Well, um, <laughs> whatever it is, I think it's worth it. Yeah, I think. I mean, remember, last year officially, we only had two SROs: one at the high school, one at the middle school. We now have seven, thanks to the hard work of the village, but also the board. You've given me. You said go out and get them. That was never in last year's budget. At roughly. 35, I think it's 40, what is it, 42 or something, a person. There's five people, it was about $220,000. Well now all of a sudden in the renegotiation, there's gonna be more costs. We've already tried to build that in. Yeah, I just, I think that's it. Because we figured nobody would want us to reduce that, especially with everything that's been happening. And we will use that in our newsletter because I think parents feel that that is one cost no matter what, we need to support. Other questions? Anything else we're missing? Or is, is there <laughs> anything up there? Like, look, okay. I gotta be fair to warn. Do you want the director of instruction on and float it for next year or what? Because that's one, the accountant is the other. Those are the two higher price of the eight items up there. Yes? I personally am okay leaving them in. As Dan mentioned, it's not like the asset list is $1.9 million. It, it's, it, 200,000 plus. Um, you, you have a plan, the, the, this, you know, your team has a plan where we need to be in three years when we start consolidating the elementary schools. And to get there, there's going to be some time needed to get us there. And I, I think some of these things set us up for that. So I, I don't think we should, in the grand scheme of things, as you said, 200,000 is 0.5% of the, the levy or something. So it, it's slight and to, to I think we just have to be careful on the cuts or, or the redistribution. So I, I kind of defer to you guys and your, your team is the district's the expert. And I think there are certain things we need to, to make sure happen properly and take a fair amount of time to prepare us for 2024, 2025, 2026. So we hit everything really, really well when the, the elementary schools bump up in size and things like that. 
So I think we have to be really careful. And also, don't limit it to just what's on. If there's something you think, we'll try to look at it and see if we can do something. That's for sure. So like I've already heard, the RTI piece. And we'll, we'll go back and look at that over the next two weeks and see if we can do something. It does bump up our gap, but if we've got some tools to close the gap, we'll try to close that gap too and add that as well. Again, trying to do what's best, stay staff strong, live the fight another day. Okay. okay. Warren, you know you and I think a lot <laughs> the same way. Because yeah, I, it's I not sitting you guys across. It's our careers, our age, I don't know, and I know I'm older than Warren. Here comes the boss. But, <laughs> <laughs> right. And I have the right to say that because I am a senior member of this board. <laughs> okay. So when I look at director of instruction, it, I, you know, there's part of me that doesn't see it as immediate with children, but it's going to filter down. And as Brian says, the changes that are going to be coming with going from four to three elementary schools, we need somebody who's going to take on that tremendous task so that those children that we're all thinking about are going to have the very best out there for them. So I can support that. I, I agree. I, the thing I struggle with, if we remove something like the accountants, we lose that opportunity and create a legacy for future board to have to clean up. And then the same with the director of instruction. Like right now, it may not look like we need it, but my concern is if we don't address it now, it's going to be a bigger issue later on when it's time for us to work I threw up my side. <laughs> Other? Anything else we should be thinking about? So tonight, we know to go down the van route, See what we can do with this. And I may pull one of these and float it as long as we, uh, I'll come back and tell you what we can do. Uh, and we will look as an instructional team as well and look at some of the other the parts that we discussed tonight. That's no problem. That's what we've done every year. I was hoping we wouldn't have to come back on the 13th, but we will need a budget meeting on the 13th. I think we got to the questions, right? I wanted to be here on the 13th. I know. She, she's like, do we have? I said, you know, the board would love to have a night off. And she's like, I need the 13th. So uh, if there's no more questions, we have Thursday, April 13th as budget workshop, 6 p.m. here. Wednesday, April 19th. And we will bring, basically, hopefully, the wrap up the budget. But we won't be going through everything. But if we can try to meet that and try to get to that bad uh, band sign or below, that's going to be our goal. And so that we bring it in and show and see if there's anything we've missed. And if not, I'll ask you that night. Are we ready to move it forward? Is that OK? It sounds like plan. Well, thank you very much. Again, those are the future budget meetings. I want to thank everybody. I, I do want to thank the staff for coming out. Uh, this is one of the most important nights of the entire budget process just because of that. It's 75% of everything we do within the curriculum and instruction. Uh, and we want to appreciate you for coming out. We know you will get people out to vote as well as the community will get out and vote. And the community has been very favorable and we want to keep it on that line. So thank you very much.
ground information, like all the core drillings and things for the parking lot? How is that tied to roofing? I will tell you, I had to go to the Google machine a few times and look up some of the vocabulary. Seismic class B, I had to go look up. And core drilling on roofing is to find out the details of things you cannot see. So like, if you remember when we did the big flats roof, they didn't necessarily do the core drilling. And next thing you know, they found this polymer underneath that it was re-roofed over. And that's why it took us the whole winter to do it, because we actually had to rip out material that nobody knew was there. So we actually took off one roof, and then we took off another roof, and then we put the new roof on. So whenever you're doing that, you're doing exploration to make sure you get the best accurate fit because in big flat situation at that time, it actually caused a major change order, which is increased cost to the district. So the more you know what's happening, whether it's our parking lot at the middle school or out here or the soil where the stadium was, you bring in uh, a firm to try to verify, to try to minimize your exposure for unforeseen costs. That's what that's about. Any other questions, comments? I will make a couple comments just real quick. We had our bid day for Big Platts Elementary School today. Uh, at, or yesterday, sorry. Oh, I thought you already voted. Thanks, sir. Any other questions and comments before the vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, big Flats, uh, big flats um, came in in about three weeks. We have Gardner Road. Uh, so we're hoping the bidders that did not win this one will be very aggressive and come back because they want to work too. We want them here. Uh, but we originally talked that inflation has happened and it, it is still there. But we expected, even over our original budget, this bid to come in about $2.5 million over. We knew that. Uh, and that, I think, was with everything being done. Uh, yesterday, we came in with just the whole project being about $242,000 above where we thought it was going to be with the million dollars that we added with ARC. But that didn't include all the air conditioning, it included part of it, and it didn't include the Trazo floor. To accept those alternates, which our recommendation is the board tells me we're good, uh, and as long as scope goes, we would accept that. We are only $800,000 over where we were, and we get the best materials. And Big Flats will have all the chillers already, at one of the prices we could not believe we got, uh, for any future remodeling in the third project. The climate control would already be taken care of. Now we just have to bring the um, rooms up. So that was a very positive bid, and if the, if the board's okay, I plan on telling them, go ahead and set that and move forward. That means between the parking lot and big flats, we're about 1.3 million to the bad, which we expect it to be about five and a half million right now. So that's best. We do have some capital reserve funding that we could use if we can't pull it back in line over time, so we're monitoring that. And uh, Gardner Road will be the next one. Once we have Gardner Road, we can assume where Ridge Road will be, and then we have to start on either the middle school or the high school gymnasium. Right now, if the trend goes forward, we will start on the high school gymnasium first, because if anything, if we have overage, that's a, the biggest part of the project, and then we will do some things that we can at the middle school, intermediate school, and pull that into the third project to finish as well. So that's just a quick update on that right now. And I do want to just mention today, across New York State, across the nation, there was a lot of squatting calls for trying to develop emergencies in schools. We put something out at 420. I want to thank the Horsehead Police Department because they handled it and immediately got in touch with the FBI. Although we were in a hold in place because they tried to target the high school, uh, they had already contacted us and said, we're coming over out of abundance of caution, but this is happening statewide. Several of my fellow superintendents have uh, got that, and they expect it to continue over the next couple of weeks. So please be aware, we take this seriously. Our, our SROs were on guard, and that's sort of like what we said. 
uh, having them here makes a big difference. So we want to thank everybody, and we hope the community appreciated as soon as we could. We tried to get the most relevant information out. That's all. Thank you. We'll move on to item four. The board does add up to uh, go to an executive session is to discuss individual personnel and legal matters. There, for the public, there will be no board action after we reconvene. But I do need a motion to adjourn to executive session at this point. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Go say nay. Any abstentions? We'll do it. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our budget meeting for March 30th, 2023 of the Horsehead Central School District. We will reconvene on April 13th at 6 p.m. in this room for a budget development meeting, which will be finalizing our budget in preparation for the April 19th regular board of education. Thank you all and have a good night.